All right, what's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuffs series. I'm going to continue showing you some of my collection. I have every ring record book that was ever printed. We just saw 1943. This is 44, 1945, 1946. This is how the ring record books looked. 1947, 1948. Now, they were established in 1941. And Nat Flasher began his Rain magazine collection in 1922. And I have every last one of those. I have the bound volumes of the Ring magazine collection, every last one, and two current. And I have the loose versions. This is 40, um, I'm sorry, 52. 53, 54, excuse the shakiness, I'm just walking from side to side. This is 55, these are all ring record books. So what's gonna happen, 1956, let me just finish out this row. 1957, 1958, so I can clear this up for you. 1959, and I have these all stacked on my counter here. We're going to go back down the line here. We're just going to look at it last one of these to show you what the covers look like. All right, we're up to 1960. 1961, 62. Now, if I want to find Charlie Burley, 63, 64. So let's go back for a second. So I showed you the first row. All the way from 1943. Now, I have every last one of these. The other ones, I have, I thought I had them in this a cabinet, because I took them out of the cabinets. But then the other, other cabinet, I'm not going to go back and pull that out. But I have the very first ring record book to the very last one. And like I was saying, if I wanted to show you something on Charlie Burley or look up on something on Charlie Burley, there's three books I can look at to find the information I need on Charlie Burley. 1943, 1945, and 1947. They have thorough information on Charlie Burley, where I may not find that on other books in the ring collection. So that's why they're different sizes. They're not gonna duplicate records on certain fighters. Now, a lot of the fighters who are club fighters or opponents I have these records on, but you'll only find them in one book. They won't repeat them in the following year. So that's why it's important to continue the collection. Now, I'm, I'm just realizing something here. So 71, so where's 73? Got it somewhere. Anyway, this is 74. Like I said, these are all rings. And what happened, every last record book had went out of print so now Flash just began his uh, record book from the ring in 1941-42. And I just I have every last every last record book. Let me just grab this for a second. I should show you. I just grab one of them. This is the bound volume of the record book for Everlast. This is 1929 to 1932. That's the third book that came out. I have every last one of those. Let me see if I can uh, hold on. Let's give you an idea what it looks like. This is Joe Glick. Pretty good champion he was. Young Jack Thompson. Now, Young Jack Thompson went back and forth with Jackie Fields. Here's Jackie Fields. Now, Jackie Fields, I had met him. He wound up moving to Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, he was originally from Chicago, as you can see here. Joe Dundee, another good fighter uh, he was. He was a world champion, as you can see here. And he took his title away from uh, Pete Lazzo. He took the title away from Mickey Walker. Here you have K.O. Brown. And you're going to have records on fighters that you won't find. 
Now, the reason why I go through these books when I do my research is because when you go through BoxRec, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, anybody at any given time can put in information. Anyone who decides, kid can put it in. And you're going to find misinformation there. Now, I'm going out on a limb by saying that. It has nothing to do with the corporation themselves. It's just that there are people who just put it in, just for, for laughs. So instead of 18 losses, you may see 20 losses. So I, I just like to be more concrete when I get my information. So this one here, Boxing 1935-1936. Have every last one of these, Primo Cornera and Max Smelling. All right, so. And again, these are, so with the 19, let's go continue here. So this is 1976, 77, all rings, 78, 79. See the kind of person I am, anytime I get involved in something, I have to try and get everything that they have. I've always been that way with records and everything else, you know, albums. So with the real to reels, I mean, we don't even use them anymore, but I had about 82 reel-to-reels of fights you won't find on YouTube. A lot of Ray Robinson's welterweight fights. I have a lot of them. But they're not on YouTube. I'm not going to put them on there myself. This is 1984, 85. 1986 and 87. That's when it ended. Joe Lewis on the cover here. This is Jack Dempsey, Jess Willard, 1919, Toledo, Ohio. July 4th. You got Ray Robinson, I'm sorry, Ray Leonard, 1984, record book. So I wanted to show you, I have every last ring magazine. This is the original magazine, February 15th, 1922. This is when it began. You have Tex Rickard to your left. Now, he was the creator of the Champions in America. And over here, you have Lord Lonsdale. He was the creator of Champions in Europe. And Nat Flasher, he wanted to begin his magazines in homage of the collaboration between the two countries. A lot of good information in there. This is the front. This is the back of how it looked. As you can see here, Tony Greb. That was the first fight that he printed on here because that's when their fight took place. Harry Greb took the title away from Gene Tunney, the America's Light Heavyweight Championship belt. And then you have Benny Leonard and Jack Britton. Now, Jack Britton and Benny Leonard was an interesting fight that took place in 22 because Benny Leonard could have been the welterweight champion of the world. He had Jack Britton down, but then he hit him while he was down. And Benny Leonard was disqualified. Unfortunately for Benny Leonard, he would lose that opportunity as welterweight champion. Now, just to show you some of the ring magazines. Now, I have them in much better condition I probably have about three each magazine. I just bought this one out. But I also have the bound volumes, where there are 12 in each book. Here is the referee. Uh, it's a program out of California. This is Carl Bobo Olsen. He would become the middleweight champion in 1953. It was a tournament. Ray Robinson had relinquished his crown in 1952 after facing, let me get a clear shot, Joey Maxim. He would lose to Joey Maxim at the Polo Grounds. I'm sorry, at Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium. And couldn't complete the round. He was basically winning every round. Matter of fact, Ruby Goldstein, who was a referee for that fight, he wound up, and, and when we go through the series, 100 years of World Championship fights in 1952, I'll go through that and explain all those details. 
I met Ruby Goldstein through a friend of mine by the name of Teddy. They both lived on Cherry Street, Lower East Side of Manhattan. And uh, Ruby Goldstein was explaining to us the details of that fight. <clears throat> but this is the uh, volume 48, number 44 edition. December 20th, 1952. And Carl Olson, he had defeated Randy Turpin. Those are the last two men standing in that tournament. It was for the vacant crown that Ray Robinson would relinquish after he retired the first time, losing to Joey Maxim. So, uh, a short video. I just wanted to give you a perspective. So, these are the magazines, or just a few of them, but I have the entire collection. of I have every last ring. Let's put it that way. Australian ring, I have every last one of those. Japanese ring, I have every last one of those. I don't think I showed you this one. Did I show you this one? Let me see. Yeah, this is the Everlast. Let me see if I get a shot. Sorry about that. I can't get a good shot. The date. 1929, 1931. I don't know if you can see it. This is the number three. I showed it to you, but I don't think I opened it up. Let me see if I can open this up. Hold this at the same time. So click. Did I open this? I probably did open this up. Okay, let me see. So bound volume basically means the bound volumes. So you have like January of 1931 to December of 1931. And they'll put them all in one book. Let me see if I can show you a cover, how that looks. I can't show you that cover, hold on. Okay, let's have a look here. So this is would be the bound volume would look like. So this is 1931 of Everlast Boxing Records. I go through these a lot because they're very, very detailed. And they're very accurate, I might add. So these are very important for me. So when I tell you records, I'm not going just on these computer websites. I go through those. I usually go through about 10 records before I actually tell you a fighter's record because I want to compare and get the closest because everybody's going to have a different record. Why? They don't do the proper research. Certain states had certain criteria. So in New York, to give you an example, Ray Robinson had faced Sammy Angott. And what had happened? Ray Robinson, to give you a better example, in fact, that might be the best example. Ray Robinson turned professional in 1940, October 4th, on the undercard of uh, Henry Armstrong and Fitzy Zivic. I'm thinking of two different things as I'm talking to you. And Ray Robinson was 19 years old. Now, that same year, he had a chance for a title shot. But he couldn't fight for the title because he was 19 years old. The New York SAC would not recognize a 19-year-old in for title shot. He couldn't go past six rounds. That's why Ray Robinson didn't fight in New York until he was about 20 years old, outside of the Golden Gloves. Because in order for him to get a title shot, he had to fight the contenders who were in the top 10, top 15. And he had to go 10 rounds in order to do that. So he didn't really come to New York until he was about 20 years old. So when you look at record books, it, it, let me just say it this way. When you compare Ray Robinson, for instance, to a Mayweather or someone else, you can't make that comparison unless you understand the game of boxing, the history of it. Because the opportunities that Ray Robinson didn't have, Floyd Mayweather had. What Ray Robinson had to go through, Mayweather didn't have to. In fact, what Ray Robinson went through made possible for Mayweather to go through. So when fighters manipulate your brain and tell you they're the greatest because of this or this man lost 19 fights, how did he lose to him? He's psychologically playing games with you. He understands or he may not understand. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit. He understands what he's telling. He just knows you don't know. So he, anyway, we we'll move on with that. You talk to any historian, they're going to laugh at you if you tell them 
you know, a lot of the nonsense I hear these debates on YouTube. A lot of the guys know what they're saying. They know you don't know. So they manipulate you. That's what it's all about. And some of them don't know what they're talking about. You know, it's a good argument, but they don't understand the details and how the game was back at that time. The laws, what couldn't be done, the promoters. All right, so I'm just uh, jamming around. All right, so I'm Scrap of Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fistical Series. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Salute to all my subscribers. The salute to the great fighters. We're going to continue with 100 years of world championship fights. I just wanted to take a little time out to show you my collection. As I said, I would. Just got a chance to get around to it now. And I will continue to show the collection as I have opportunities in time. We'll probably look at Nat Flasher's Ring Magazine collection. I'll show you as many of them as I can from 1922, you know, as far as I can go up, try and spread them out for you. And then we'll go through other record books. I have every record book. I have, I have probably about, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, I probably have about, I don't know, 500 record books all over the world. So... And then magazines, I have just about every single magazine you can think of, programs. And I just that was something that I was involved in as I was younger. And I decided to, you know, keep them. Every last card, I think I have a lot of them. Oh, man, 5,000 boxing cards all over from the teens, you know, 1800s all the way up. All right, so thanks for hanging in with me, tolerating <laughs> my... Uh, lecture to you hope you enjoyed this video i salute oh i know i wanted to show you this is jake lamada the raging bull phenomenal fighter he was he was unbelievable he was from the bronx new york and they called him the raging bull but he was really a light heavyweight as an amateur he fought as light heavyweight and then he would shrink himself down to the middleweight Reminded me a lot of Roberto Duran in that way because he knew because of his height and his arms, he really wouldn't make it as a light heavyweight in the professionals, which he wound up doing later on towards the end of his career. But he would um, he would walk around at 180 pounds, sometimes 200 pounds, and he would get down to 159 pound limit when he would face the middleweights. When he fought Ray Robinson from 1942 to about 1944, I want to say, 1950, he was always a light heavyweight, but he would weigh in as a middleweight. And he had same-day weigh-ins, and he would immediately go, and he would eat steak and orange juice and, you know, drink orange juice. And he would squeeze the blood out of um, the steak. Now, Ray Robinson said that he did that. You know, when you look at the movies, you, you get certain stories, but Jake LaMotta did that because he didn't want to chew the food because he was trying to. He would just spit it out, trying to make weight. But, um, yeah, Jake LaMotta was something else, man. When we get to the 50s, we'll learn a lot about Jake LaMotta. Now, here you have the great Sugar Ray Robinson, Walker Smith, from Alley, Georgia. And he would move around to Detroit. That's where he met uh, Joe Lewis. They lived a block away from uh, Bruce's Center, then Ray Robinson. And Joe Lewis was about six blocks, probably about five blocks away from Bruce's Center. And he would walk to the gym, and Ray would wait for him in a corner to carry his gym bags for him. And that's where he met Joe Lewis. But they wouldn't let Ray into the gym. He was too young. And then Ray would eventually move to New York with his parents. He would tap dance on the street. And he would join the... It was a church. It was the... Um, Harry Wiley, who was the actual head trainer in that church. It was a boys club. And... As a lightweight, he was knocking out middleweight. So he had to go over to Grubbs Gym on 116th Street. And that's when he was sparring with Danny Cox and light heavyweights and heavyweights. A lot of people don't know the story with Ray Robinson, but he was real good friends with 
Louis Spider Valentine. Now, he's defeated Spider Valentine in the 1939 Open Class Finals. And Spider Valentine couldn't beat Ray Robinson. So when Ray Robinson moved up to the lightweight division and he defeated Annie Nanelli for the finals, Spider Valentine stayed down in the featherweight and he would become the open class featherweight championship in the Golden Gloves in 1940. But they were very good friends. And uh, Valentine was, he was somewhat the guy in New York. And when Lewis, I'm sorry, when Ray Robinson defeated him, they gave him a lot of credibility. But he was friends with, uh, with Valentine. You had Sandy Sadler, who came from Boston. He was the youngest of that group. You also had Danny Cox, who was the heavyweight. And who else? It was another guy that used to be with them. And they would, they would get a job at the Harlem Opera House. And the Harlem Opera House was located on 125th Street, uh, probably a block away from the Teresa Hotel. And uh, Harry Smith, Harry Smith was the one who got him jobs before he passed away in the late thir- in the middle thirties. And he got him jobs at the Harlem Opera House. So Ray Robinson, he was something else, man. He was something else. Eighty wins, sixty nine knockouts, forty knockouts in the first round as an amateur. And he was a lot younger than you believe he was because he had to exchange his name from Walker Smith to Ray Robinson in order to fight in the AAU championships. Wasn't allowed to fight in the championships because of his age. He was 15. And he lied and said he was 18. So um, Robinson is a lot younger in his career than you think he is. Very good fighter was Ray Robinson. Now we look at Ezra Charles. Ezra Charles. Ezra Mac Charles. Cincinnati Cobra. Another great fighter. And he had lost, you know, an opportunity. In fact, see, he was ranked number one in the middleweight division. But he didn't get an opportunity with Tony Zale. Tony Zale froze all these guys out. And he defeated Charlie Burley twice, Archie Moore three times. He was a remarkable fighter. It was at the Charles. But Jimmy Bivens defeated as a Charles and... Lloyd Marshall, I mean, Lloyd Marshall was a phenomenal fighter himself. All those guys came around in the 1940s. And we're going to be going through all their careers as we move on to the 40s. In fact, we're close there now. We're doing the 1942s now. I'm just trying to dissect a lot of these guys, just put them on the map, because they don't really get mentioned as often as they should. And my brother, Kurt Sugar, and I talk all the time about these guys and how shameful it was that they don't get the recognition that they should. Shout out to uh, Hardline Boxing. He really gets into details with these fighters. And and that's what is needed. You know, these names need to be brought up because of the respect of the game. This is Charles. See him here, 1950, New York Yankee Stadium. He had to solidify his belt that he won in 1949 with uh, Joseph Joe Walcott. We had to solidify it because it was the NBA version that he would win from Walcott. It was a vacant crown that Joe Lewis would leave behind. And he had to solidify it with Joe Lewis. And that's what made him universally recognized as the World Heavyweight Champion when he defeated Joe Lewis in 1950. As you can see here, September 27th, 1950, in New York Yankee Stadium. Now, Sandy Sadler, another remarkable fighter he was. Unbelievable. He was out of Boston. And my grandfather knew him, and my father knew him. In fact, my father locker in Stewart's gym was two lockers away from Sandy Sally. They used to walk home together because Sandy Sally was living in Manhattan at the time. And they would walk to the train and they would take the train back. But Sally lived on the east side and my dad lived on the west side. But Sandy Sally And Jimmy Carter, (laughs) they both were interested in a girl named Lulu Bell. Young lady. She was the queen of the block. And Jimmy Carter was dating Lulu Bell. Sandy Sally didn't like it. Those two wound up fighting each other. (laughs) 
But Sandy Saddler would have his wars with Willie Pep, as you know, but he would also be in there with guys like Charlie Riley out of St. Louis. And many other good fighters. He used to spar a lot with Ike Williams in Stillman's gym. Shout out to uh, Sandy Saddler. And here's Jimmy Carter. I was mentioning Jimmy Carter. He would take the lightweight championship crown away from Trenton Thunder. As you can see here, Ike Williams. Fight uh, 1951. Knocked him out in the 10th round. And a story on that, my grandfather told me that Ike Williams, I mean, nobody could beat Ike Williams during those years. And my grandfather found out that Jimmy Carter had a shot with him. He saw Jimmy Carter because it was... Jimmy Carter was dating Lulu Bell, who lived in the same building as my grandfather. So they used to sit in a stoop all the time. When my grandfather was coming home, he told Jimmy Carter he needed to see him. Carter didn't know what he wanted, but he went upstairs anyway. My grandfather asked him, did he want a drink? Carter cleverly said, no, thank you. And he asked him, he said, I understand you're going to fight Ike Williams. He said, yes, I am. He said, no, you don't understand. I need to know, can you beat Ike Williams? He said, yes, I am. He said, I got a lot of money riding on this. And he said, I am. Because Ike Williams was tied to the Philadelphia mob crime family. And you also had Newark, New Jersey's welterweight champion, Johnny Saxton. He was also tied to the mob. So you never knew on any given day what would happen. But Carter said, yes, I will beat him. And he did. He knocked him out in the 10th round, as you can see here. Madison Square Garden, and that was an upset. Nobody thought that Ike Williams would be stopped in this fashion by Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was a hell of a fighter. In fact, to this day, he's the only three-time lightweight champion in boxing history. Phenomenal fighter was Jimmy Carter. And by the way, Jimmy Carter was friends with my grandfather and my father as well. Here you have, and he told me a lot of stories about him, Jersey Joe Walcott, Camden, New Jersey, a lot of people don't know that him and Joe Lewis was trained by Jack Blackburn. And I think that might, when I continue with the series, that might be the next thing on the agenda. Jack Blackburn, he died in 42 in Chicago. And I'll go through those details uh, about Jack Blackburn. He had trained Sammy Mandel and Lou Ambers, Canada Lee, Joe Walcott, and Joe Lewis. And he's the only trainer to bring two black fighters to the world championship, basically back to back, because you had Joe Lewis, 1937 to 1948, uh, technically 49, and then you have Ezra Charles. And after Ezra Charles, you would have Walcott. So Jack Blackburn, had trained two black fighters to become heavyweight champion back to back for the most part. Incredible. But Jack Blackburn was in the ring with Sam Langford six times, Joe Gans, Dave Holly, Harry Greb. He was a phenomenal fighter, was Jack Blackburn. Now, here, when you look at the junior lightweight champion, Todd Morgan, the first one was Pinky Mitchell. He was the first junior. Welterweight champion, 1922, is when that division originally started. Here you have Al Singer and Bob Olin. Now, Bob Olin had lost his crown to John Henry Lewis in 1935. Al Singer, <laughs> him, Sammy Mandel, Tony Canzanieri. <laughs> Amazing. Remember when Tony Canzanieri knocked out Al Singer in one round? Al Singer knocked out Sammy Mandel in one round. This is all within six months. This is something else between those three fighters. The Brockton Blockbuster, Rocky Marciano. Could this man punch? He had the endurance of a water buffalo, the heart of a lion, like literally. He was something else. <clears throat> in this fight, 1951, uh, 1952, excuse me, um, 